Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you all and to worship with you today. We're continuing in our Stranger Things series where we're talking about some of the things that we find in the Bible that sometimes can seem strange, can seem confusing, sometimes make us wonder, are these things just stories or are they actually true? And if they're true, are they still true today? And so if you're with us when we started the series, we talked about the supernatural. And is it a real thing? Does God operate in the supernatural? And the big idea that day was that the biggest mistake we can make is to overemphasize or underemphasize the supernatural. But we see that God works in both the world that we can see, touch, and experience, and yet he also works in the spiritual world. And that makes a difference. The next week we talked about the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we're really good at talking about God the Father and Jesus the Son, but what about the Holy Spirit? And we talked about how this Holy Spirit is a gift that Jesus gives to us. It's his constant presence, and he empowers us and guides us and gifts us. Then last week we heard a powerful message about Satan. A lot of times we just think of the devil as the little guy on our shoulder dressed up in red with a pitchfork. But the reality is that there is evil in the world and that Satan is working and we need to be on guard and we need to realize all the resources that God has given to us to fight against Satan. And so today we're going to continue on in that line and we're going to talk about how does God equip us to fight against evil in our life? How does God wire us up? How does God gift us? How does he empower us? so that we can take on and defeat all the forces of evil. So I'm going to invite you to grab your bulletin and look at the message notes, because we've got a lot to get to today, and, you know, you can fill in the blanks if you'd like. It means you'll be ready for the test, all right? But you see, today what Paul wants to communicate to us, and we already heard this in the scripture reading today, he wants us to understand that we're actually living in a war zone. We're living in a war zone. We're amidst an intense battle. And all of our thoughts and our actions and all of our thoughts are involved. And the thing is, every waking moment, but not just that, even as we're sleeping, we're in a combat zone. Now, I'm not talking about a foreign army physically invading Golden Valley right now. We hope and pray that doesn't happen. But what I'm talking about is what's called spiritual warfare. And it's something that might sound strange to some, but it's something that's very clearly that we need to be ready for in Scripture. So I want to focus just on the first couple verses that we just heard read, and I'll read them one more time. Paul tells us, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes or can be translated as strategies. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, what Paul is telling us, again, is there is a battle going on. And without God's help, we're going to lose. But you might wonder then, well, who in the world are we fighting? Or what in the world are we fighting? Well, Paul says very clearly, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. This isn't a war against other people. We're fighting against the spiritual forces of evil, and it's more than we can just see, feel, or experience. It's in the heavenly realms. I had somebody ask last week, what, what does that mean? Does it mean there's an actual battle between good and evil in heaven? No, that's not what it's saying. The heavenly realms is the spiritual world around us. God is reigning and ruling in heaven this is in the spiritual world that's all around us. And as Jason talked about last week, Satan is alive and he's active in our world and he's able to impact and intervene in our lives and in our world. 
And his favorite thing to do is to destroy people. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy, Paul says. And the way that he does that is to impact our lives in the most subtle ways. And we talked about how two of the ways that Satan likes to operate is by telling lies and then by making accusations. He loves to lie about us, to bring lies into our life, and he loves to accuse us. That's what his name means, the accuser. But the thing we need to remember is that Satan is already defeated. Jesus has already won the battle. One day, Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead, we say in the creed. He's already victorious. He's going to make everything all right. But until that day, Satan is on the loose, and he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. So every time you have the opportunity to do something or say something vindictive, every time you have the opportunity to spread gossip about someone, every time you have the opportunity to have a lustful thought or to say something hurtful or to be harsh with someone else, Anytime you have the opportunity to feel superior to other people, you've entered the spiritual battleground. There's a battle going on for your heart and your mind and your soul. There's a force at work in our world that doesn't want you to do good things, to think good things, doesn't want you to grow in faith, and doesn't want you to live for Jesus. It's a a force that wants you to completely forget God's love and grace. It wants you to completely forget what Jesus has done for you. And instead to replace all of that with guilt and shame and fear. Some of you have maybe studied the Civil War before. I was reading about a battle called the Battle of Antietam. It took place in 1862. And it only lasted 12 hours on one day. And it's one of the bloodiest battles that took place in the entire Civil War. 10,000 Confederate soldiers died. And even more were said to have died on the Union side. And the thing is, the Union Army was led by a mediocre general. He wasn't very well respected. His name was General George McClellan. But he was somehow able to defeat the brilliant Robert E. Lee and his forces. And in fact, he drove Lee's forces back across the Potomac River. So how in the world was this possible? A mediocre general and a brilliant strategist. Here's how it happened. Two Union soldiers found a copy of Lee's battle plans a few days before and were able to deliver them to McClellan before the battle. You see, in much the same way, on our own, none of us are any match for Satan. But just like with General McClellan, our enemy's plans have fallen into our hands. We already know his strategies. He's going to entice us with lies and lust and greed and all of those horrible things. But you see, with that knowledge and with the power of God's word and with the Holy Spirit in us, well, we're able to resist all of Satan's attacks. So the question is, how do we best withstand all of these attacks? How do we stand firm in God's power? Well, for Paul, as we see in Ephesians 6, It's about putting on the full armor of God. And here's the big idea today that I want you to remember. When we put on the full armor of God, we can stand firm against the devil's schemes. When we put on the full armor of God, it's then that we are able to stand firm against the devil's schemes. Now, notice a few things if you look at the scripture passage from Ephesians 6. First of all, Paul is very specific. This is God's armor. 
he starts with saying, be strong, what? In the Lord. And he says, in his mighty power, put on his armor. Don't try to do it alone. Don't ever try to do it under your own strength. We can't do it alone. On our own, it's hopeless. But everything changes when we're in God's power, when we put on his armor. Now, Paul also says, put it on. Armor doesn't do any good if you just leave it on the ground, right? I remember visiting a guy in the hospital a number of years ago who had a horrible motorcycle accident. And he told me about how the day of the accident, he had bought this beautiful brand new motorcycle helmet. But the thing is, he didn't put it on. He put it in his bag and he drove his motorcycle home. And right before he got home, he hit a patch of sand and his bike flipped and he hit his head. You can have the greatest armor in the world, but it does no good if you don't actually put it on. One other thing Paul says is he says, put on the full armor of God. Don't just put on a few pieces of it. It's kind of like, I don't know if your kids are like mine, but my kids have to be reminded in the winter to put on every item. Like put on your coat, your hat, your gloves, your scarf, your snow pants. No, you can't wear sandals outside. Put on your boots. Maybe you need to be reminded today to put on the full armor of God. Because he designed it all to protect you. Now, in the end, the full armor of God is really about applying the gospel. It's about taking the good news of the gospel and applying it to your life. It's about living out the gospel each and every day. And there are really seven key aspects to living out the gospel. So I'm going to read it again one more time so we have it fresh in our minds. Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith which you, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So let's break it down for a moment. First, he says, put on the belt of truth. What this is about is surrounding yourself with the truth. Not just listening to what the crowd thinks or what's popular or what some pundit on TV has to say. Paul says the first key is to be surrounded with the truth of God. Hold everything up to the truth of God's word. If something isn't true, ultimately it's powerless and it will not stand But remember, Jesus in Matthew 7 says to build your house on the solid rock of God's word. Hold everything up to God's truth. The truth stands up when it's attacked. It's solid as a rock. And just like when you put a belt on, it holds everything together. Never give up on the sheer power of the gospel. It reminds us that the truth is God's already victorious, that God is always graceful, that he's always forgiving. You see, Satan deals in lies and deception. Satan tries to tell you, well, you're not good enough. Satan will try to tell you you're beyond hope. Satan will try to tell you that God's sick of you and he's left you behind. Remind yourself every day of the truth that God loves you. And it's no more clear in how he sent Jesus to die for you while you and I were still sinners. Every day, put on the belt of truth. Be surrounded with the truth of what God says and what he's done. Well, number two, 
He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And this is about guarding your heart. Roman soldiers had a very small breastplate. It was about yay big. It was just big, big enough to protect your heart. The most vulnerable spot to enemies' arrows, to swords, to spears. You see, Satan will attack whatever part of your life is not fully trusted to God. Whether it be your relationships, whether it be your work, your ambition, your future plans, your family, your friends. What area of your life have you not fully trusted to God? What part of your life are you thinking, I can do this on my own? Because that's precisely where Satan will attack. It's where we're most vulnerable. As I mentioned before, Satan always tries to accuse us and to tear us down. He'll go after those things that are close to our heart and close to our mind. He loves to sow the seeds of doubt and worry and fear, and he loves to make us feel alone and insecure and hopeless. And again, one of his favorite things to do is to make us doubt God's love and instead to feel guilt and shame. But remember, God proclaims that we are completely forgiven, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And it's that that will protect us from Satan's attacks to our heart. In the book of James, James says, flee from the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Every day, draw close to God. Take a step of faith and he'll draw close to you. If you flee from the devil, even one step, he will flee from you. Next. Paul says, have feet fitted with the gospel of peace, which I like to just think of boots. Put on your boots of peace. And part of this is being ready to go make a difference. Are you ready to go make a difference for God? Now, Roman soldiers, when they put on their boots or their sandals, they had nails pounded into the soles. And it was so they could dig into the ground and they could stand their ground. The other forces would come running at them. They could plant their spot and they could not be knocked over. But also shoes, boots, they make sure we're ready to go when we need to go. We're ready to move. We're ready to serve. Just like you probably heard when you were growing up, your parents wanted you to go somewhere. They'd say, get on your shoes. We need to be ready to go. That's what God is inviting us to do. Put on your boots or shoes of peace so you can be ready to go. One of the keys to having peace in this world is forgiveness, right? Because God has forgiven us, we're called to forgive others. And when we go out into the world with a heart of forgiveness, when we're the least offendable people around, well, we bring peace where we go. In fact, I think As the church, we should be the most peaceful people in all of the world. And it's this kind of peace founded on what God has done for us in Christ that helps us face and withstand the chaos and the conflict of this world. And also, it helps us as we share the good news with anyone we meet. When we have a peaceful heart, when our shoes are ready to go, we can go and tell people about Jesus. We can help them see the gift that God wants to give to them. Next, Paul says, take up the shield of faith. You see, it's our faith that will protect us. Faith will protect us. He says, when the flaming arrows of Satan come, It's your shield of faith that will be able to protect you. Now, Roman shields were about four feet tall and two feet wide. And they'd protect you from anything that came through the air. But also, they were designed to lock together with other people's shields. 
So you'd come together with other soldiers and you would make a wall to protect each of you. It's interesting throughout the Bible that faith is really the only thing we're consistently told to fight for. All the other fighting is kind of God's thing. We're told to fight the good fight of faith. Jude says, contend for the faith. Paul says, I've run the race and I've kept the faith. Every day, we can fight for the faith. Now, the thing about faith is it's not just believing in God. In fact, the Bible says even Satan and all of his demons, they believe in God. They're not atheists. But there's a difference between believing in God and believing God. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between believing in God and actually believing God. Believing God is having faith. And it's a faith that he will do what he says he will do. So arrows are going to come at you. Doubts, despair, apathy, worry, fear. But it's your faith that will protect you. And remember how much faith we need to have? Jesus says, faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the tiniest little speck. Even that much faith can move mountains. You see, Satan wants us to think God has forgotten us, he doesn't care, or he doesn't exist. Keep the faith. Faith is the opposite of cynicism and skepticism and negativity, and complaining. I mean, how often as a church do we fall into those negative patterns? What if we kept the faith instead? We believed the best about others. We believed the best about what God has in store for us. Faith is a shield that will protect us from the lies of the enemy. No matter what happens, it's just a knowledge that God is going to take care of everything. He's still present, he's still loving, and he's still victorious. Next, Paul says, put on your helmet of salvation. A big part of this is it reminds us who and whose we are. I like to think of it kind of like a ball cap. You know, if you look around, people wearing ball caps, a lot of times it's a logo of a team, right? A team that they want to be associated with. You can tell a lot about somebody by which team they decide to wear. Like, I have big questions when someone wears a Yankees cap in Minnesota, right? It just doesn't make sense. But oftentimes it's our hat, it's our logo that helps show people who we are and who we belong to. The helmet of salvation tells everyone who we are but also who we belong to. We've already received the promise of salvation when we put our faith in Jesus. We've already been rescued from our enemies. Our team has already won the World Series and the Super Bowl and everything else. Our team is already victorious when we're on God's team. But not just that, the helmet of salvation is also about having the mind of God. You see, we can either allow God to control our mind or the enemy. What if every day we kept reminding ourselves and remembering what it means that we are saved by Christ? When we hear questions and doubts and skepticism, what difference would it make if we remember we have the helmet of salvation on? When you, st- when you struggle with despair, you just remember all he's already done for you. There is hope. When you feel like your life is out of control, you remember God's perfect plan. When you feel negative and critical, you remember the joy of the Lord. The helmet of salvation reminds you who you are and whose you are. Well, then he says, take up the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is God gives us words to live by. The book of Hebrews says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God is powerful. It always accomplishes what it says. 
and there's no lie, no distortion, no false anything that can ever overcome it. You see, a Roman sword was designed to pierce the flesh. God's word pierces the heart. When we need to fight back against Satan's attacks, what we need to use is God's word. When we need to counter the lies of the enemy, remind him what God says. When he tries to stir up doubt and fear, throw God's word back at him with confidence. It's why it's so important that through the week we're opening up our Bible or we're reading a devotional, getting into God's word because we can use it to counter the enemy. Have you ever had those times something is happening and you're stressed out or you have questions or it just seems like an awful day and suddenly a piece of scripture or a passage will come to your mind? It's no coincidence. God will always give us his word to counter the lies of the enemy. Finally, there's a seventh piece of our armor. And it's not really an object, it's more of an attitude, a practice. He says, I always be praying in the Spirit because that's actually the most powerful weapon we have. Pray with confidence. Know that God is working and he hears your prayers and actually listen for what he has to say. Praying is how we release the power of God into the world. It's the most powerful resource we have, yet we so often take it for granted. Again, in the book of James, James says, you don't have because you don't ask. Keep on asking for God's will to be done, for him to show up in power, for him to expand his kingdom. Always be praying in the Spirit. I want you to notice one more thing as we look at this passage from Ephesians 6. Four times Paul says to stand. Four times. Stand your ground. Stand firm. But it makes me wonder, why don't we get more offensive weapons? Like, why don't we get a spear or a bow and arrow or a machine gun or something? Like, why can't we have some more offensive weapons? I think the reason is it's because Jesus has already won the war. Catch this. We don't fight for victory. We fight from the position of victory. We don't fight for the victory. It's not in question. We're fighting from a posture and a position of victory. And we have a God that's willing to fight for us. Now, if you've ever watched a movie or a TV show that portrays medieval battle, you know it's just a messy, awful thing, just bloody and horrible. Oftentimes what happens is everybody just kind of runs at each other, and it's just a big clash. And what was most important for medieval soldiers was to stand their ground and to protect their six-foot square section of land, all right? Not to be concerned with what's happening everywhere else, but to stand their ground and to protect their part of real estate. As I mentioned before, the shields were designed to lock together, to make a wall. And what that tells us is that we're not fighting alone. No, instead, we need to fight together. We're called to stand firm together. And the interesting thing, when I looked at the Greek in Ephesians 6, is it's actually not individual commands. It's not something that we each do alone. Instead, he says for us to put on the armor of God together, plural, as the body of Christ. Every day, what if every one of us together put on the armor of God? What if we helped each other and encouraged each other and fought together side by side? You know, when one soldier starts to feel overwhelmed, someone else picks them up. One more thing to notice. As you go through all the armor of God, there's only one area that's not protected. It's your back. The breastplate covers our front, covers our heart, but there's nothing covering our back. 
It's why Paul says four times to stand firm. Don't turn your back. Don't run away in fear. You're not protected. Stand firm and confident in God's promises. Stand firm and fight together. Because you're already victorious. Psalm 23 says, God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Have you ever thought about what that means? Sounds kind of crazy when you stop to think about it. God prepares a feast right in front of our enemies. Because we don't have to be afraid. God's kind of showing off a little bit. He's taunting them a little bit. We're already victorious. He's going to throw a banquet right in front of our enemies because we are victorious. One final thing, so important when we talk about spiritual warfare, and that's this, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. When we pray in Jesus' name, the devil has to submit. If you're ever feeling under attack, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, simply speak the name of Jesus. Now, I've done quite a bit of mission work in third world countries, and I've seen people who have been possessed or oppressed by demons, crazy things that we never see in this country, and we always see the power of Jesus' name. When you make a command in Jesus' name, everything changes. And it's because his power and his authority are ours in the Holy Spirit. When in doubt, when in question, always claim the power of Jesus' name. So church, together, let's put on the full armor of God. And as Paul sets out to say, let's be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And together, we're already victorious. And together, we can help God advance his kingdom in this world and make a difference for him. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your power and your grace and your creativity. We thank you for your victory that you've already won through sending your only son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and to defeat evil and death and Satan once and for all. God, help us to remember that we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a position of victory. God, help us as the body of Christ to put on the full armor that you offer to us every day and to go into this world and make a difference for you, to go love others in your name, to tell people the good news of the gospel and to live it out with all of who we are. God, help us not to give in to fear or negativity or criticism or complaining, but instead to experience the joy of the Lord. Help us to make a difference for you. Help us to be a vital part of your team. God, today we lift up our ministry partners, St. Louis Park Free Church and Dinner at Your Door in Minneapolis. We're thankful for their ministry. We ask that you would bless them and you would work through all that they do to bring more people to faith. God, we also pray for all those in our church community and beyond who are struggling with the death of a loved one or a diagnosis or other valleys in their life. We ask that you would wrap your loving arms around them and that you would use us as the church to come and surround them and to lift them up. God, we thank you for what you are doing in this church. We thank you for the 10 people last week who were baptized in the park. We thank you that your kingdom is expanding through the ministry of this church all around the world. So God, continue to work in and through us. God, help us every day to serve you better and to love you more. And so God, we come together and we pray the powerful words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen.